times. This week, we're going to conclude our study of prayer by looking at the presentation, what we offer to God in prayer, what it should sound like, how it should be composed, and then we're going to look at the predicaments in which we should be praying. As we consider the presentation, we're going to think about this from two aspects, from two points of view. The composition, how we should compose our prayers, and then the delivery. What should come forth out of our mouths? What kind of words and how should it sound? So the composition and the delivery are what we're going to consider as we think about the presentation of prayer. Remember we mentioned that in Exodus chapter 30 and elsewhere in Scripture, a comparison is made between the altar of incense, the incense that was burned in worship to God in the temple and in the tabernacle under the law of Moses, and the prayers of saints. There's always that connection. There is an intentional um, type and shadow, a, t- a figure in the incense to our prayers in the church today. In Exodus chapter 30, God gives Moses a, a recipe for the incense that was to be burned in the temple in worship to God. And that recipe was not to be used for any other incense outside of the temple. It was specifically for the burning of that incense there in temple, in the temple in the worship to God. In Exodus chapter 30, beginning in verse 34, we find, The Lord said unto Moses, Take unto thee sweet spices, stacti, and onica, and galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense, and of each there shall be a like weight. And thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. And thou shalt beat some of it very small, and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation, where I will meet with thee. It shall be unto you most holy. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto that to smell thereto, shall even be cut off from his people. This perfume was to be used specifically for this purpose. It was to be used in the worship to God in the temple and the tabernacle. There was a recipe. We see that also in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 6. Luke records this, uh, this occasion in Luke chapter 11. And he says that on this occasion, his disciples came to him and asked Jesus to teach them to pray. But we have a more full account of the prayer in Matthew chapter 6 and the Sermon on the Mount. But that's exactly what Jesus informs us there is that there is a certain recipe. There is a certain formula that we should hold to our prayers. Jesus says, after this manner, therefore pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. As we, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. He's teaching his disciples to pray. He tells them what not to ask for and what words not to use, the, the posture not to take. And then he gives them an example, a model of prayer, what prayer should be, what prayer should sound like, the composition and the formula for a prayer. And so we understand, according to the biblical examples of prayer, that there is a certain expected composition of the prayers that we offer. And especially these things will apply to the prayers that we lead publicly. In the worship services, uh, when we are together, Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that it is God's will that men do the public praying, that men pray everywhere, not the women. Of course, we sometimes draw heat because... Uh, We don't have women preachers in the church of Christ. We also don't have women song leaders or women prayers because that's God's will when it comes to the conducting of our public assemblies. And so these things apply that we're going to say about prayer this morning apply especially to when we're leading public prayers. But women in ladies' days and in uh, Bible studies, Bible classes, they lead prayers publicly as well. And so you uh, you need this information as well. But there is a certain composition that we're expected to observe when it comes to the prayers that we offer to God. And we're going to notice some things that, that are common among all of these prayers. 
when we think about prayers, the prayers that we pay, pray publicly, we can kind of compare it to writing a letter. And maybe they don't teach this as much as they used to in school, but uh, when I was going through school, we were, we were taught how to compose a letter, a business letter especially. There's always that formal address, and then there's the body of the letter, and then there's a salutation. There's an ending or a closing of the, prayer, of the letter, and we're going to apply those same parts to the prayers that we see in Scripture. We're going to notice especially, we're going to use as our examples, uh, a prayer that Solomon prays in 1 Kings chapter 8, a prayer that Daniel prays in Daniel chapter 9, and then the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer here in Matthew chapter 6. We'll make several references to those three prayers as our examples this morning. But as we consider the composition, comparing it then to the parts of a letter, we see that in almost every prayer, especially the public prayers that are led as recorded in Scripture, there's always this reverent address to God. There is always an invocation of his name. It was there in Psalm 51. David is pouring out his heart to God. It's there in 1 Kings chapter 8. Solomon there is leading a public prayer. All of the people are assembled together at the dedication of the temple. It's a very special occasion. It's a religious ceremony. And Solomon the king leads them in a prayer to God. And he addresses God. Uh, but I want especially to take a moment to notice Daniel's address in Daniel chapter 9. On this occasion, Daniel is now quite an old man, and he's been in captivity since he was a teenager. And as Daniel has studied and read through the writings of Jeremiah, he understands why they're in captivity and how long that captivity is going to last. And Daniel here pours out his heart to God in confession of sins, on his own behalf and on behalf of the people. And notice in Daniel 9 verse 4, this address, the, the way he begins this prayer, the way he approaches God. Daniel 9 verse 4, I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. And then he says, we have sinned. But he addresses God reverently as the, as the occasion befits to begin. He opens his prayer this way with a reverent address to God. Jesus does the same there in the model prayer. He says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's always appropriate for us, especially when we're leading public prayers, to address our Heavenly Father reverently. And that means that we don't use terms like Big Daddy or, or Cool Papa Bell or whatever some today might be trying to use in their language of prayers. The examples of prayers that we see in Scripture always begin with a reverent address to God, understanding and appreciating the privilege that we are engaged in, the, the solemnness, the solemnity of the occasion, that we are coming before His throne, that God is high and holy and almighty, and therefore, it calls for a reverent and a very respectful address to God. And as we noticed even last week in John chapter 16, Jesus says that we will pray to the Father in His name. And that's the way that we conduct our prayers as well. We do not pray necessarily directly to Jesus Christ or to the Holy Spirit, but we pray to God the Father as Jesus instructed us in John chapter 16. There is some um, discussion, there is some debate, there's some argument in the brotherhood about whether it's appropriate to pray to Jesus. And we won't get into all of that right here and right now. That's a separate issue for us to consider. But we do know that it is approved for us to pray directly to God in the name of Jesus Christ. We know that's an acceptable form or composition of our prayers. And so as we are thinking about praying publicly, especially to God the Father, we begin our prayers with a reverent address, appreciating both the privilege and the power of the words that we're speaking. We begin with that reverent address, and then we move into the needs that we have on our hearts and minds. 
we pray in different situations. And so the body of our prayer, after we have approached the throne of God and addressed Him respectfully and reverently, the body of our prayer consists of praying for those things that we're called to pray for, the things that are on our hearts and minds, the needs that we are facing. It may be uh, that we're leading the opening prayer in a worship assembly. We pray for uh, the things that we do and say to be in accordance with God's will. We pray for those who have been mentioned on our prayer list. We pray for our nation. We pray for all those things that are appropriate as we begin to focus our minds and think about what we're doing in worship. The closing prayer might sound a little differently. We have now conducted our worship. We pray that it will be acceptable. We're about to depart. We might pray for God's blessings as we go forth into the world, but it would sound a little different. The prayer for the Lord's Supper would be even different. But we must keep in mind then, as we're leading these prayers, the purpose for us approaching God and His throne in prayer. When we pray at our meals, we're praying for our foods. We might give thanks to God for His great blessings upon us in every area of our lives. But it won't sound the same as the opening prayer of a worship assembly. When we're praying, for, uh, when we're praying on special occasions, we're praying at a wedding or a funeral, those words will be somewhat different. But it's uh, according to the examples that we have in Scripture again, the body of the prayer consists of us praying for the needs or for the the purpose and the occasion of that prayer. And again, we see in these three examples that we mentioned, three very different occasions for prayer. First Kings chapter 8, we have this religious ceremony. We have the dedication of the temple. And, and Solomon uses uh, a great deal of praise and, uh, and glorification of God in his name in that prayer. That's the that's the body of that prayer. It's lifting up God for what He has done and asking God to watch over them and as a, as a nation as they move forward from that point in history. Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is on his knees. He's pouring out his heart. His tears are streaming down his face as he considers the sins of the people. It is a confessing prayer, and that's, the, that's what the body of his prayer consists of. And then in Matthew chapter 6, we have an example of of just a basic, simple, everyday prayer. The Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, is Jesus praying for our, our daily needs. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. It's a very everyday, regular, normal prayer. Three very different occasions, three very different reasons for prayer. Each one of them following a certain formula. There's an address to God, then there's the body of it, and Usually there is a conclusion, uh, but each one of them differs in what they consist of because of the purpose for those prayers. And then as we end the prayer, it is always important for us to remember that we are approaching God's throne under the authority of Jesus Christ. Because He is our high priest who lives and abides forever, because He is in heaven at the right hand of God making intercession for us, the only way, the only reason that we have the privilege of coming before the throne of God is because Jesus Christ gives us that authority. We are priests in His priesthood. We are serving under Jesus Christ. And because of that, we can approach the throne of God in prayer. So as we conclude our prayers... It is always important for us to remember, even if we don't necessarily utter the words, especially in our private prayers that we're going through, we're speaking to God in our own hearts and in our own mind. It may not be necessary for us to actually say the words, in Jesus' name we pray, but we must at least know that in our hearts and in our minds as we're offering this prayer to God. The only reason that we have the privilege of doing so is because Jesus Christ has given us that authority, because He is our high priest. It's also important for us to remember that we are praying that the will of God be done. As we noticed uh, in some of our previous lessons as well from 1 John chapters 4 and 5, that we must pray that the will of God be done. And in every prayer that we offer, for every occasion, whatever the reason is for our prayer, our prayer needs to be, that God's will be done. Now that may not always be exactly what our will is, 
But we must always be in such submission to God that our prayers include the idea that we want God's will to be done and not our own. That was what Jesus prayed even as he faced death on the cross the night before. Father, thy will be done and not mine. We usually conclude our prayers with uh, the word amen. And certainly that's appropriate. The word amen means so be it. Um, the word amen is again not one that we necessarily have to. That's more of a a formality. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 did use the word amen, uh, but it would be even more appropriate for those who were listening to a public prayer and were following along and praying that with the one leading, it would be even most appropriate for them to follow up with that word prayer, meaning I, I would agree with that. That would be my prayer as well. So be it. Let that prayer be according to the will of God. We mention here again John chapter 16 where Jesus gives us this instruction that from this point forward, after his death, after his sacrifice, we will no longer ask him anything. But he says, you will pray to the Father in my name. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto ye have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name. And I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. And so as we approach God in prayer, no matter what the occasion is, we always want to include a reverent address to God, uh, a respectful calling upon His name. And then we make known what's on our heart. We address those issues that are confronting us for whatever occasion we are bowing before God in prayer. And we conclude our prayer with a remembrance of God, Jesus' authority, the fact that we have the privilege of approaching God in prayer, and we want to offer this prayer in the name of or under his authority. Now that's what seems to be the recipe for the prayers that we offer. And again, we know that according to Romans chapter 8, as we noticed, verses 26 and 27, sometimes the issues of our hearts are beyond words. We pray to God in, in not an audible form, one that can be heard. Nothing passes through our lips, but prayers are going through our hearts and minds. And even then, we must remember that we're praying under the authority of Jesus Christ. We're praying that the will of God be done. But it may not sound exactly in our heads like a public prayer would sound. But certainly there is a formula, there is a composition, there is a, a recipe that God expects for us to use when we come before Him in prayer. It is that solemn of an occasion. It is that reverent of a privilege that we get to offer to God these spiritual sacrifices. It's something that we need to take very seriously. So with with that formula and that recipe in mind, let's consider how then it should sound when we pray. What delivery should we use? And these are just some, some tips and some pointers, especially for our young men, our young women, as they're, as they're learning, as they're beginning to pray, but also for those of us who have been praying for years, praying publicly for years. Some, some things that we need to keep in mind as well. First of all, I think we see this in the prayers that we find in Scripture. We don't want to rush through a prayer. We never want to just use the same format, the same delivery, the same pace every time. Remember what you're doing. Remember that you are coming before the throne of God in prayer, that He is listening to you. You have His ear. There's never a need for us to rush through any aspect of worship, but especially as we are communicating our hearts and the desires and the petitions that weigh upon us to God our Father. So never rush through a prayer. It's okay to take our time to speak clearly, to be succinct, because God is listening to us. So don't rush through any prayer, public or private. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6 not to use vain repetitions. The heathen the, use vain repetitions. They would have Phrases or sounds that they would repeat over and over, and those sounds would really come to the point where they had no meaning 
But this was part of their prayers that they were offering to their false gods. And Jesus says, don't use those kinds of vain repetitions. We want to use words that are appropriate to the occasion. Those vain repetitions means we're putting no thought. That's why they're vain, they're empty, they're hollow. Those words don't mean anything. We're not thinking about what we're praying. And sometimes we can get into that rut where we pray the same thing before a meal, where we pray the same thing before we go to bed, or where we pray the same thing in a public prayer. And we want to avoid just mindlessly going through any prayer. We always want to put thought and intention behind the words that we offer. So don't rush through it. Don't use vain repetitions. It's okay to use certain phrases uh, regularly. Um, we hear, what are some of the more popular phrases that we're known for using give us a, give the preacher a ready recollection again we hear that often and that doesn't mean that it's a vain repetition just because we hear it every once in a while but we have to put that purpose and intention into those phrases we have to put thought into the words that we're using don't rush don't use vain repetitions it doesn't have to be an elegant or a great flowery speech as well remember the the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18 and Jesus' parable there in comparison to the publican, the Pharisee was trying to draw attention to himself with the words that he used. And that's not what we're trying to do in prayer. We want to be concise. Uh, I think the, the examples of prayer that we see throughout Scripture are to the point, especially Jesus' model prayer in Matthew chapter 6. They're very simple. They're to the point. They're concise but they need to be expressive as well. We need to be able to express the purpose that we're coming before God. We need to use words that are appropriate and adequate. In many occasions, it might be appropriate, especially in our own personal and private prayer lives, to pray Scripture. Sometimes in our public prayers, and uh, we may make reference, we may make reference to. Uh, a passage of prayer. We may use a phrase that we know comes from Scripture. We don't have to tell God where that's found in the Bible. He already knows. But, uh, but it's always appropriate to pray Scripture. So many of the Psalms, like we read this morning, Psalm 51, are composed as prayers. It is always appropriate for us to pray the words of Scripture in our prayers to God. God can say it so much better than we ever could. And so that's always a good idea. It might be a good practice to, to get into, to start praying Scripture, to start finding passages of, of the Bible that are formed as prayers and just use those as our daily, especially personal and private prayers to God. They don't have to be beautiful, flowery rhetoric. We don't have to use fancy words that no one understands. We're praying with words that express what's on our heart and what's on our minds. Don't have to rush. Don't have to use vain repetitions. We don't have to use flowery words. But we do need to, as we've said, remember the occasion. I can remember when I first began serving on the Lord's table. I was about 12 years old. And I, hadn't yet, I didn't yet have this understanding of prayer. And I would pray the same prayer on the Lord's table that I would pray over a meal at home. And it wasn't proper or appropriate, I might also include the Lord's Supper, but I had everything else in there as well. And my dad would take me aside and, and he would instruct me and tell me that that's not why you're there making this prayer. So we need to remember the occasion. In fact, as Micah is getting older, he might use the same prayer every time at a meal, but when he's called upon to lead a prayer for some other purpose, I'm impressed, even at 14, at his ability to remember the occasion that he's praying for. So we always want to keep in mind the occasion and the purpose for which we're praying. We also want to remember as we're leading these prayers publicly to remember our audience. The audience is not the church. The audience is not our family. When we go to God in prayer, he is the audience. We're speaking to him. He's our only concern whether he understands what we're saying. Whether his attention is drawn by our needs and desires remember as you offer these prayers to God whether they are public or private that God is the audience he's the one who is receiving the prayer it doesn't matter really then what the audience what the people around us hear or whether they approve 
it must be approved by God. Remember also your altar. These prayers that we offer, as we've already mentioned, have a comparison to incense in Scripture. There are a couple of passages I want us to look at in the New Testament that tell us that when we go to God in prayer, this is part of the sacrifices that we offer as the priesthood of, of Jesus Christ today. And if we're offering prayers and we're offering songs as, as spiritual sacrifices today, there must be an altar upon which those sacrifices are, altered, are offered. That altar is our heart. That's where these sacrifices are originating from. That's where we're approaching God is in our own hearts. Hebrews 13 verse 15 says, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. We offer to him the sacrifice of praise when we sing. When we sing a cappella, we sing from our hearts. We pluck the strings of our hearts. But we also offer him the sacrifice of praise when we pray. Both of those are the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. And then in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, the passages that we've already made allu allusion to several times. 1 Peter 2 verse 5, Peter says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now that especially seems to be a reference to our prayers. He says these are spiritual sacrifices because you are the holy priesthood of Jesus Christ today and they are offered to God. They must be acceptable to God by the authority of Jesus Christ. So if our prayers are part of our spiritual sacrifice, the altar upon which they're offered is our heart. We must always be mindful of the condition of our heart when we approach God's throne in prayer. Never lift it up with pride but always bowing before Him, always in submission to Him, always praying that His will be done and not our own. Always consider the condition of our hearts. There's more we could say about the delivery, about the presentation, but I think these are good reminders. These, are, uh, these come from biblical examples that we have, and I hope that these will help you as you Pray more, more often, more frequently, and more fervently to God. Let's then consider when. When can and when should we pray? There are more examples of prayer in Scripture than we could ever cover in a series of sermons. And those prayers will come from those who are praying them in every situation that we could possibly face. And I'm not going to give you necessarily a biblical example of prayer for each one of these. But you'll know in your own lives that these are times when you have prayed and when you should pray. We should pray both when we have sinned and we, when we've succeeded. One of the great powers that prayer contains is that we are forgiven of our sins when we confess those things and when we repent of them and when we pray for them. That's how we apply the blood of Jesus Christ to our sins after we've obeyed the gospel through prayer, asking for that forgiveness, demonstrating that repentance. But not only do we go to God when we've sinned, when we've fallen into temptation, when we've given in to the, uh, the wiles of the devil, but we also pray to God when we've had a, a success, when we've overcome those temptations, when we have Chosen righteousness in a moment of doubt when we have succeeded in doing the right thing. That's a perfect opportunity for us to go to God in prayer and to give Him thanks for the word that He has given us that guides us and directs us in those moments. So both when we have sinned and when we have succeeded, when we are sad and when we're shouting, when we are, have lost a loved one, when we when we have experienced some loss or some pain, when we have physical health issues that we're concerned about, those certainly are times when we go to God in prayer. We ask Him for comfort, the peace that only He can afford. But then at the same time, when something good has happened, when we have a reason to rejoice, when our child has accomplished something, that's a reason, that's a moment for us to hit our knees in prayer. 
that is every bit as appropriate as those times when we're in need and when we're hurting. We want to go to God both when we're sad and when we're shouting. And then in moments when we're scared and when we're sure. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 tells us that in every temptation there is a way to escape. God always makes a way to escape. So no matter what temptation we're facing, we can rest assured that there is a way for us to come out of this without committing sin. Now we may be in a moment where we're scared, we don't know what to do. And that's a moment where we pray, we ask God to, to show us through His Word what we should do, how we should handle this, which direction we should go. But also when we know that we have done right, we know that our lives are lived in faithful submission to God every day, those are moments that we need to be before the throne of God, regularly expressing our thanks for His blessings, frequently invoking His blessings on us as we try to stay as close to His throne as possible, both when we are in moments of fear and when we are fearless. We want to go to God in prayer. We also want to go to God when we are in need and when others need us. We have need of the daily blessings that God affords all of us. He sends His rain on the just and the unjust. He will provide His daily bread. And certainly we want to pray prayers that we know God will and can answer. But we often go to God on our own behalf when we know that we have those needs. But we don't as often go to God in prayer when we know that someone else is depending on us. When others are the ones hurting or suffering, they need us to pray for them. And so we want to remember to go to God not only in our own time of need, but when others are depending on us as well. And then we want to go to God both when we are burdened and when we are blessed. Sometimes we're down, we're depressed, and we don't even know why. Sometimes it's just the daily routines of life that, that cause us to wonder why these things are happening the way they are. And our hearts are burdened. Prayer always lifts those burdens. It always helps. may not remove them completely sometimes, but it always helps. But then also in those times where we feel like everything's going right, God is blessing us more than we deserve, those are times when we need to go to God in prayer. I remember the, uh, the lesson, the devotional that uh, Brother Levi gave a couple of months ago, and, and Sister Linda mentioned it and referenced it even, I believe it was this morning, on Facebook taking that uh, anagram ASAP, A-S-A-P, as soon as possible is the way we've always used it, to instead mean always say a prayer. So when should we pray? What are the predicaments in which we should pray? What we come to understand is God wants us to pray anytime and all the time. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. And in the very next verse he says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. He wants to hear from us. He wants us to pray. There's a certain formula. There's a certain recipe that we should observe. And we want to pray appropriate prayers to every occasion. But we want to remember our posture. We want to remember the passion that should accompany every prayer that we offer to God. We're coming before His throne. It's a privilege. And God wants to hear from us. As we mentioned last week, God hears us when we are faithful and true to Him. When we are His children, God hears our prayers. When we pray according to His will, when we pray under the authority and by the name of Jesus Christ, we can know that we will have the things that we ask for. But for one who is not a child of God, one who has not repented of his sins and obeyed the gospel, that person's prayers cannot be heard by God. Because Isaiah says in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 that it is our sins and our iniquities that separate us from God. It's not that he's powerless. It's not that his arm is shortened that he cannot heal or his ear deaf that he cannot hear. But our sins and our iniquities prevent God from hearing our prayers. If you're in a position this morning where your sins have never been washed away through obedience to the gospel, Believing in Jesus Christ, repenting of your sins, and confessing His name, you need to be immersed in water. You need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so your sins can be washed away and so God can hear your prayers. 
But if you have done that and you recognize now God is not hearing your prayers because you are regarding sin in your heart. You know there are sins that you haven't confessed and repented of. Now's the time to make that change. Prayer is doing you no good if you still have sin in your life. If you need to take care of that, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, won't you do so by coming forward at this time? You know, we hear the term, may we never forget. We hear that term often in our country. We hear it for Memorial Day, Veterans Day, D-Day, Flag Day, Independence Day. You know, there are 19 different military holidays to remember those who gave us our freedom. We hang flags at our house, at our schools, at our businesses, in our city squares. We have shirts and hats that honor different branches of the military. We have statues and memorials in our cities and in our nation's capital. We have parades to celebrate those so that we will never forget. But you know, if I were locked in a dungeon for the rest of my life, I'm still free. Here's a list of some things that I wrote, may we never forget. May we never forget the gift, the love, the perfect life, the betrayal of a friend, the arrest, the beatings, the scoffing, the love, the trial, the vote to release Barabbas, the crown of thorns, the robe, the sign, king of the Jews, the love, the cross, the nails, the vinegar, the thieves beside him, the death, the love, the spear, the blood, the empty tomb, the stone, 
the guards, the love. The earthquake, the angel, the empty tomb, the risen Savior, the love. May we never forget what was paid for our spiritual freedom. To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 384, all four verses, Lead Me to Calvary. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be, lest I forget. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross on our behalf. We remember the debt that was paid. We remember the pain that he bore. And we remember the love that was shown to us. We pray that as we partake of this bread, which represents Jesus' body, we will do so in remembrance. In his name we pray. Amen.
let's give thanks for the blood. Heavenly Father, we remember the blood that so freely flowed from Jesus' side. We remember the love that that represents. We pray that as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents his blood, that we will do so in a manner that's pleasing unto thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have also on the first day of the week the command to give back, to give as God has blessed us. And there is a box on the back for you to make your contribution in. And let us do so with a cheerful heart, remembering all that God has done for us. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we give you thanks for all the great blessings you bestow upon us, for the spiritual blessings of your love, your forgiveness of a home in heaven with you in eternity. And we, we give you thanks for these blessings, Father. We also give you thanks for the great physical blessings that we enjoy, our homes, our families, our jobs. And we pray that as we give back, that we will do so with open hearts and with, uh, with free hands. And we pray that we will do so with cheerfulness. And we pray that these monies might be used to help those who are in need and to spread the borders of thy kingdom. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We've had three real good lessons on prayer today and the previous two Sunday mornings. David, we want to thank you for these. All of our lessons are on the internet, so if you missed any of them or you'd like to go back and study some more on those, you can go to YouTube or you can go to our website and the link is there for these lessons. I have just a few announcements before we dismiss. It was so good to be back in Sunday school this morning. You know, sometimes you don't miss things, and or you don't really miss it too if you don't have it. And we've really missed our Sunday school classes, so it's good to be back. Let's be sure to remember that uh, this coming Wednesday night, we'll resume our classes for our midweek service. Also, this coming Saturday night, Jonathan and Jennifer will host the Trail of Treats at their house, 5 to 8 p.m., set up at 4.30. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Everyone is invited, and remember there's, there will be a prize for the best adult and child costume. There will be a ladies' night out on Sunday, November 8th, in the ARC room. That's three weeks from today. The cost is $35, and there will be painting, Christmas door, hangers. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyers. And ladies, if you have any questions, you can see uh, Molly Bradford. David will be having a lesson this evening on Facebook and hope everyone will plan to be back Wednesday evening for our midweek service in our class. Lads and leaders, remember that you will meet at 6 o'clock Wednesday evening in the ARC room. After another song, Scoot Wilson will lead our closing prayer. If you would, please stand. Number 440, 440, my Jesus, I love thee. Sing the first and last verse of this together. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee all the follies of sin I resign, my gracious Redeemer, my Savior.
Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings that you've given us. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins, that we have the opportunity for heaven. Lord, we thank you this morning that you allowed us to resume our Bible classes. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us to worship you this morning. The songs that we sang, the prayers that have been heard in your word, and pray that our worship has been acceptable in your sight. Lord, pray that you would be with Shirley Thornton. She's in the hospital. Pray for recovery, if it be thy will. Pray that you be with each of us as we leave, and pray that we can be a good example and to the light for those around us. Forgive us for our sins. In Christ's name, amen.